Today, Secretary Carter announced his final determination to fully integrate all military positions, career fields, and specialties to women. I want to take this opportunity to state that I stand behind Secretary Carter's decision and fully support opening all special operations specialties and units to female service members. By the original order in January 2013, all the services in SOCOM were given the opportunity to request specific exemptions to this policy. After much study and careful consideration, I did not choose to submit a request for an exception for SOCOM. I want to take this opportunity to explain my recommendation to you. The SOCOM staff and our component teams have worked diligently on this effort over the last two and a half years. Our components conducted a thorough review of our doctrine, organization, training, material, leadership and education, personnel, facilities, and policy. We looked hard into how integration would affect the cohesion and capabilities of our tactical formations. We also commissioned the RAND Corporation to conduct a survey and hold focus groups to gain insight into the perspectives of the force to thoroughly understand your concerns about the integration of women into the closed special operations career fields and units. I want to firmly state right up front that as we move forward with integration, we will absolutely not lower, raise, or create multiple sets of standards for special operations. If candidates meet our time-tested and scientifically validated standards, and if they have proven that they have the physical, intellectual, professional, and character attributes that are so critical to special operations, we will welcome them into our ranks. There are four principal factors that figured prominently into my decision to not seek an exception to this policy. To begin, our first soft truth is that humans are more important than hardware. This truth applies equally to women as it does to men. And the fact is, special operations benefits from a more diverse force. Diversity in our force provides access, insight, and perspective that you simply can't get with a homogenous force. We need a wide range of exceptional people to be combat effective and to help us address the complex security problems of today's environment. As our former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Michael Mullen, has said, it is vital to have people and voices at the table who collectively offer broader perspectives than anyone could alone. Second, SOCOM and Special Operations have a proud and successful history in leading integration efforts. One of our predecessor organizations, the Office of Strategic Services, is a good example. One in five members was female, to include some who were on Jedburgh teams. Major General Wild Bill Donovan, himself a Medal of Honor recipient, described these women as vital to an organization which touched every theater of war. In our modern special operations forces, we have had unique programs in place for over 25 years to include our civil affairs and military information support operations. We opened air crew positions in AFSOC to women in 1993. Since 2011, we have very effectively employed women as part of our cultural support teams in Afghanistan, where selected female service members placed with our strike forces effectively doubled our access to the population. We opened the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment to women aviators in 2013. Integration is not new to special operations, and we have benefited from having women in our ranks. Women serve with us in staff and leadership positions and are as committed to our ethos of quiet professionalism as anyone else. Third, after weighing and considering the rigorous analysis of factual data regarding the requisite knowledge, skills, and abilities, and taking into careful consideration the advice provided by your commanders and senior enlisted leaders, I have determined that there is no compelling analytical data that would support an exception of policy for special operations. Finally, the United States is a nation of opportunity. We serve in a society that is built upon the belief that every American should be afforded the opportunity to rise to their full potential. Each of us who serve in the special operations community today was at some time afforded the opportunity to challenge our assessment and selection processes. If people, men or women, can meet our standards, then they should be afforded the opportunity to achieve their full potential in the special operations community. This integration does not come without concerns. In making my recommendation, I was aware of the medical studies that strongly suggest that women incur injuries at a greater rate than men. I was also aware that some cultures and regions in which we operate may not be as accepting of female operators as they are of male operators. Additionally, I was aware that some service studies have indicated that gender integrated teams may perform at a lower level than all male teams. We looked at all studies very carefully. Ultimately, 
I determined that based on our time-tested and validated assessment and selection standards and processes, our experienced leadership and our mature approach to mission accomplishment would mitigate these concerns. We know from experience that our highly successful operators come in all shapes and sizes with diverse skills and attributes that contribute to the team. I want to emphasize that the number one guiding direction from the chairman was to ensure the success of our nation's warfighting forces by preserving unit readiness, cohesion, and morale. These concerns are absolutely paramount. America's military and special operations forces are the best in the world because of our rigorous training and standards. These standards have proven to bring in the right people to our community and we will not change them. We must always ensure our training standards are valid and directly linked to operational requirements. The Women in Service Review gave us the opportunity to study our training standards to ensure they reflect the requirements of today's battlefield. Our process used an industry-recognized standard and was conducted by neutral third parties, the Naval Health Research Center and the Office of Personal Management, working side by side with our training staffs. The results were significant. We ultimately determined that our standards, time and battle tested, were absolutely relevant to the challenges our operators face on the battlefield. Therefore, we can say that our current standards are based on occupational requirements and neither favor nor prejudice any demographic or gender. Several interviews with female service members confirmed that any deviation from these validated standards would only undermine a potential candidate's credibility and be a disservice to our special operations community and those who are seeking to serve in it. We understand that the only path to true integration requires that successful completion comes without caveat. Our standards are and will continue to be the gatekeeper to service in our special operations career fields and units. They are protected by public law and have the full support of our commander. The bottom line, our standards have worked for decades and we're not going to change them. Trust in our assessment and selection processes to maintain the quality of our special operations forces. I am confident that our effort will ultimately serve to benefit our community, our military, our society, and our nation. We will create an environment that is fair and equitable for all who have the courage and fortitude to challenge themselves in our assessment and selection arenas and who desire to serve the nation as members of this select community. I am depending on our leadership to lead this integration, and I charge all of you to uphold the maturity and quiet professionalism that is the hallmark of America's Special Operations Forces. Thank you.